My mom took me to the local A&P grocery store, where Mr. Rutland was the manager. And uh, as we walked through the different aisles, I guess I was about eight, seven or eight years old, I saw a box of cereal, and it was a free toy inside. It was a series of fish. And so I told Mom I wanted that cereal. Well, it was a sugary kind of cereal. She didn't want me to have that cereal, but I really wanted not the cereal, but I wanted the toy that was inside of the cereal. And this began my life of crying. <laughs> it's because when she went around the corner, I sort of lingered in the cereal department. And I thought, you know, I'll just check it out. So I took the box, and nobody was looking, and I opened it up, and I peeled it open, and I stuck my hand down, and lo and behold, I'd hit the jackpot. I not only got a fish, but I got two. So I put it back in my pocket, closed it up, sealed the box, put it back, and I thought that was that. Until we got home and Mom saw me playing with my two little fish, rubber fish. She said, where'd you get that? Well, I had to race for an answer. I found it on the street, I told her. Uh-huh. So, but you know what was going on inside was guilt. And one sin led to another sin. Not only had I stolen, and I knew better than that, but I had lied about it to cover my tracks. They have to be careful that kind of story because I told it when my son was just a little boy, about five or six years old. I told it to a group of children down front to just say one sin leads to another. And I was the new preacher in Hopewell. And I picked up a bunch of kids to take him down to the swimming pool. And he was with his little buddies. And while we were driving along, I was listening to the kids talking in the back seat. And I'm the new preacher in town. He says, you know, my dad steals. <laughs> I said, and he lies too. <laughs> I had to explain that you know, the moral of the story was not to do that, not that it's okay, but that was my life of crime that began. But what I remember distinctly was the violated conscience and in lying to my mom. That bothered me for a long time. Now we read this story in Genesis chapter 3. We've been going through Genesis 1, Genesis 2 about the creation of human beings. Genesis 3 continues the narrative of Genesis 2. The story of what we'd say is Mr. Human and Mrs. Life. Eve means life. Adam means human. It comes from the Hebrew word Adam that comes from the earth. The earth creature comes from Adama, the earth. Adam, Adama. We don't always get those play on words into English. But before us, what Doug read so well today is we have an ancient story that has been mulled over, interpreted, overinterpreted, thought about over and over and overthought about for thousands of years. But the story has shaped Western theology largely due to the comments made about it in the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, Romans 5, followed by the North African theologian and Bishop Augustine, and from Europeans like Martin Luther and John Calvin. It is an ancient Hebrew account of temptation, disobedience, and the consequences that followed from a rift in the relationship with God and kept working out in the rift between the relationship and human to human. But though the tale is simple and it's straightforward, it contains universal truths. It condenses truths into a story form. For it isn't just about some ancient ancestors in a land far, far away, way long time ago. It is about us. It's about every man and every woman. Compacted into this little story, we find a depth of theological and psychological insight that sheds light on the human condition. What are some of the things that we can learn from this story? Well, here's some things. And you can follow. I've got the uh, outline in your, in your uh, bulletin if you want to follow along with me. We live in God's world. That was chapter 2 which is filled with abundance and with blessings galore. God made a beautiful world and provided all things necessary to sustain life and to cause human beings not just to exist, but to flourish. And God created human beings depicted in the characters of Adam and Hawa in the Hebrew Eve. And God called them to a task, to till and to keep the garden. That is, to mix 
human labor with nature to make it even more beautiful and more useful. So one thing we learn from the story is that we have a calling. We live in God's world, and that has we have something to do in this world. God granted us the use of the earth, why? For human benefit. And we're to use the earth as good stewards of God's world. It belongs to God, and we serve by being responsible stewards in caring for the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein, the psalmist said, and we prayed today, Psalm 24. We live under God's call. God has given us something to do. And we live under God's permission to use the earth. You can eat of all the trees of the garden, but we also live under God's prohibition. In the story, God had communicated that one tree was off limits. The reason is not even explained, only assumed that God means it. The story doesn't answer all of our questions that are curious. God has our human interest in mind and our well-being in mind, and we do well to practice simple, unadorned, unvarnished obedience to God's commands. But then, here we are with permission, a calling, and a prohibition. That is what life is all about. There's some things you just don't do. There are certain things that we are allowed to do, and there's many. And then we have something to do. That's God's calling. But then enter the snake. The dynamics of the story as we open up in chapter 3 begin uh, very potent stuff. It's a highly symbolic material. This is a news reportage of a current event that somebody could have captured on a videotape back then. The characters, the props, the actions of the story stand for much more than an account of a past occurrence. So we must avoid reading the story more than reading into the story more than is there, we should avoid reducing the story to a simple historical report. The snake confronts the woman. It doesn't say it was the devil. That's been one way of looking at it. That the devil sort of transmuted or Satan or the devil. It doesn't say that. It doesn't refer to any kind of demonic or magical creature at all. It rather is a creature that is, a, is like the other creatures that God had made. This snake can talk, and in the story, and this is sort of signals that it's more like folklore, there's nothing seems amiss or strange in the story that the snake comes up and talks to the woman. The text describes the snake as more cunning, more shrewd than all the other creatures whom God had also made. The world-renowned theologian, Swiss theologian, Karl Barth, was once asked by some of his students, do you really think a snake spoke? And he said, well, whether a snake spoke or not, I don't know, but I'm sure interested in what he had to say. What did occur? There's a subtle question. The snake in this story is kind of a prop and merely places a thought in the woman's mind. The thought was to doubt God's motive in making the prohibition. It was just a thought. In the story, there's no forced action, there's no coercion, there's no flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. No. It's just a little question, a thought to consider. Did God say you'll not eat from any tree in the garden? Is that the prohibition? Now, we know that the snake knows better than that. But it gave Eve the chance to respond and be right first. It's deeply psychological. The woman said to the serpent, it says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. Now, God did not say that. God said don't eat it, but she added more to it, which we often do is we would say here's the rule, but we got all these other things around it. You can't do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. She added to the commandment. And then the snake takes off the mask and exposes the real motive for the inquiry. The serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so here we have what the story was getting at. The problem that we have in human existence is sin, disobedience. Sin is a choice. It's not a forced action. And what was the temptation? The suggestion was that we can be as God, knowing good and evil. Now... 
It doesn't mean that I have an intellectual knowledge of good and evil. This is what in literature we call a merism, where you'd say, from the east to the west, or God made all things from heaven to earth, or A to Z. It's, you'd use the extremes to say everything in between. And in the Jewish way of looking at life, to know good and evil does not mean intellectually only. It doesn't mean, oh, now I have a grasp of right and wrong in my mind. It means I actually experience it too. That we can know more, understand everything, and that we can become masters of our own fate, captains of our own destiny, and enhance our lives by being like God, which is the failure to accept that we are already sufficiently in God's image. Being a creature under God's image is enough. The temptation was, you can get along right well without God. God did not really want you to get the tree, because once you got it, you'll know what God wants, and He'll be unnecessary, and you can live a secular way just the way you want to live, without reference to God or with God's Word. Being, under, being a creature under God's image is enough, and to know all things is the meaning of the Hebrew idiom. I know and I can make all judgments without reference to God. It's not just intellectual knowledge, but sufficient experience and knowledge to judge all things without reference to God. And then the snake leaves. Leaves it at that. The woman molds this over. No coercion. So it says in the Bible, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, which appeals to our sensual desires, it's something good. It's something that we would enjoy. And that it was a delight to the eyes, appealing to more aesthetic tastes. It's beauty. Nothing wrong with that. And that the tree was desired to make one wise, which is the highest, loftiest desire for universal wisdom. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Very simple, unordained, un unadorned disobedience to a clear command. Now the elder in the New Testament that we call John wrote that little letter of 1 John at the end of our New Testament. He put it this way. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride and riches come not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. Temptation comes to us in many ways. And we must resist it and be vigilant and victorious. And temptation is all around. Temptation to hate is there. There's so many reasons to hate today. Turn on the news. Listen to the radio. To harbor a grudge and keep it going for years. To seek a moment of revenge. Oh, how sweet it is if I could just get back at that person and show them and hurt them the way they hurt me. To steal. To commit adultery. To share slanderous information about another person. Oh, how sweet are the morsels of that gospel. None of us are forced to do anything. But first we entertain the thought we ponder it before ever acting. James, the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, wrote, No one who is being tested should say, God is tempting me, because God cannot be tempted by any form of evil, nor does He tempt anyone. Everyone is tempted by their own cravings. They are lured away and enticed by them. And once those cravings conceive, they give birth to sin. And when sin grows up, it gives birth to death. So that gives us some insight. God had given a clear command. Eve decided that she knew better, or at least it was in the thought that God's will was to not enhance her life, but to diminish her life, to keep her from some important thing. We learn something else from this ancient story. Free will. We are not robots, we're not puppets, we're not automatons. God created us and gifted us with the gift of freedom, and we are free to obey, and we're also free to rebel. Eve was tempted because the fruit was pleasant to the eye. It was good for food. It desired to make one wise, so she partook. 
But seldom do we wish to sin alone. We bring others into the web with us. He also gave to Adam, who was just sort of stupidly standing there, to bring him into the fellowship of this secret knowledge. But rather than it enhancing and they become like gods, their eyes were open and they felt for the first time shame, guilt, and fear. No fear, no guilt before that. No shame. Shame and guilt are the immediate consequences that they experienced of an activated conscience that knew that they had done wrong and were no longer pure before God. Something had changed, that something was amiss. Shame in their nakedness and fear of encountering God was a new experience. And their immediate impulse was to cover it up and to hide. They preferred now to not be with God. Then the Lord God shows up. We find a beautiful portion of this little story. In that ancient way of looking at it, God walked in the garden in the cool of the day, seeking fellowship and conversation with Adam and Hawa. But sin had entered them and they hid themselves from God's presence. You know how many people avoid church? Avoid talking about God, elude religion and feel threatened by it because their hearts, in their hearts, they sense something that troubles them. It's hard to imagine, but the fact is there's some people, every time I come to church, I feel guilty. I've had people tell me that, so they stay away. It's just the story of Adam and Eve because we're hiding from God. Mr. Human and Mrs. Life, which speaks of all of us, are cowering, avoiding God, furtively seeking ways to elude an encounter with the living God. God called to the man, Where are you? As though God didn't know. And Adam knew he was found out. There would be a question in the next time, in the next episode, of where is your brother? So where are you and where is your brother are two existential questions for us. But Adam was found out. How can you hide from the Lord your God? I stole two fish. I couldn't hide. I couldn't even hide it from my mom. So God confronts Adam. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in the middle of the garden that I told you not to eat? And Adam, confronted by the truth of his disobedience, turned on the one who was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Adam blamed Eve. And in fact, blamed God. Um, uh, but the woman that you gave me She's the one who did it. She gave it to me, and so what can I do? I hate. I hate. One of the main ways we deal with our wrongdoing is the denial of responsibility. That's why in church when we come together, we sometimes have prayers of confession. Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us of our trespasses or sins. Like one little girl said, she thought it was saying, forgive us of our trash baskets as we trash basket against others. But the trespasses only was worded just says sin. Denial of responsibility and blaming others. You've never, if you've had two children, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. God confronts then Eve. She also evades taking responsibility. She blames the snake. And as I've said it before, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> the denial of responsibility and assigning blame outside of oneself are marks of how we deal with our own sin. And so then, judgment. The disrupted relationship that is now marked by guilt, shame, and fear hiding, blame, and denial of responsibility. The disrupted relationship with God produced many of the ills that we experience as part of the human predicament. We cannot read Genesis 2 and 3 without reading 4, 5, 6 as the earth begins to spiral into a spiral of violence, war, hatred of one another. Cain kills Abel and things even get worse. That's the message that the ancient writers and editors wanted to convey. To the woman... It was sort of a, what we call an ideological story, a story that explains why is there pain in childbirth, difficulty in labor, difficulty in her partnership with her husband. It says the man will rule over you. And patriarchy is a reality all over the world. It is not God's will. It is a mark of a disrupted relationship that the partnership of equals was then made into a hierarchy, one over the other. 
it's unfortunate that church often reads the Bible in such a way that we think that we're supposed to continue hierarchy and patriarchy, but it's a wrong reading. To the man, it explains that toil and difficulty with the soul and the production of food outside the garden, and that because we were taken from Adama, we will return to Adama. From dust you are, to dust you return. And then the final part of the story is the cherubim, which are several creatures, and exclusion from the garden and no more access to that tree of life, is explaining that we do not have access to immortality or the true of life, tree of life. We must live as mortals, subject to death, and <coughs> striving for grace. Unless God extends it to us. Now that brings us to the last point, grace. Though the humans fell under God's judgment, God did not abandon them. Although the sentence of death was passed, it was not carried out immediately. The pair in Genesis 2 and 3 did not die right then and there. God's grace has the last word. And in fact, Adam names woman Eve which means the mother of all the living, Mrs. Life. God, in the story, clothes these two creatures with skins to prepare them to live outside of the garden in the world as it is. And that's what God is doing for us all the time. We live in a world of sickness, death, thorns and thistles, war and conflict. Why? Because there's a basic fundamental rift between our relationship with us and God. And Christ has come to restore that relationship. What does Genesis 1 through 3 te teach us so far? Real quick. God made everything and pronounced it good so that nothing is to be feared and nothing is to be worshipped but God. And God made human beings and placed us in a world made for our benefit. Also, God called human beings to serve as stewards of God's creation. And God endowed us in the image of God, with intelligence and curiosity, with emotions, the ability to experience beauty and love. And God gave us free will to obey and enhance our life or to rebel and diminish human life. And God placed in the human heart the capability to transcend our present state and strive for something higher. God made human beings communal animals. It's not good for the human to be alone. And we live under three mandates. God's calling or vocation, permission and freedom to use our human labor and mix it with nature to enhance and enjoy and beautify. But we also live with prohibition. Some, some things do not enhance but diminish human well-being. And God's righteous judgment is also attended by grace. And God wills life and prosperity for us all. That's what we learned from the first three chapters of Genesis. Let's close today.